Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, dear Jesus, you are our cornerstone. And Lord, as we've been worshiping you on your Sabbath day today through many different ways, Lord, I just act, ask that this is an act of worship that's acceptable in your sight today as we bring the word of God. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit. He's here. We're asking for him to be here in more abundance now. Send your angels to this place, we pray. And may your name be glorified in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, tis the season, whether you're ready for it or not, it's here, Christmas season. And you know, it's, an, it's a great time of year, right? We get to be with family, we get to be with friends, we get to eat some good food. It's a really great time of year. And when I started dating my wife, Callie, I had to get used to a couple changes during the Christmas season. See, when I grew up, my family, we didn't really give a lot of Christmas presents. It wasn't a big deal for us. But for Callie's family, that is like Christmas, that's what it's about, is giving gifts. Not, not trying to, that's a good thing, though, that's a good thing. Just a difference. Can I start this over, maybe? No. So I had to adjust. Now I had her family now asking me, okay, what do you want for Christmas? I had to get used to making a wish list for Christmas. And so what's on your Christmas wish list today? And in fact, not just your Christmas wish list, but what's on your wish list from God this morning? And let's not call it a wish list. Let's call it a want list. What is on your God I want list this morning? And as we begin our sermon today, that's what I want us to start reflecting on. God, I want. What's on your want list today? When we open up the word of God, we can see a couple, a married couple, that have a big want on their God I want list. So open up the Bible with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and we'll start in verse 5. Luke chapter 1, we'll start in verse 5. To explore this couple, they have a big God I want item. And it reads, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest... Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in the commandments and requirements of the Lord. Before we start looking at the want that they have, let's just notice what Luke is talking about, who these people are. First of all, he describes them as righteous and blameless, and it comes towards the law. Now, to be righteous, we know that God gives us righteousness. We can't earn it, right? It means to be in correct relational standing with God, and God promised to do that for us. So this points to these people, Elizabeth and Zechariah, having deep, deep trust in God's promises and letting them live out in his life, in their lives. Also, to be blameless towards the law. Obviously, they sin. They're not perfect. But God also promised to forgive sins. And so, again, this points to the fact that they trust in God's promises and that God's promises are living out in their lives. And not only that, their names point to this. Zechariah comes from a Hebrew word, zakar, which means to remember. And his name means Yah remembers or God remembers. And so in the context of the Old Testament, this means that God has made a promise and he's going to remember that promise and he's about to fulfill that promise. Just like when the children of Israel were in Egypt and they were in slavery and they were crying out to God, God, get us out of slavery, it says, does anybody remember? God remembered the covenant he had made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he got them out of slavery. So his name points to God being faithful to his promises. Elizabeth, her name also means God is an oath. So God himself is a promise. And so as we open up just these few verses here and we meet these people Luke is wanting us to focus on the fact that God makes promises and he fulfills those promises. And we can trust that. Now, it's not always easy in our lives to trust in God, is it? Circumstances in our lives can make that hard. That's why we have God I want lists, right? And so this is what was on their want list, verse 7. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Ooh. You know, talk about a want list. 
And maybe some of you have this on your God I want list, a child. In fact, later on, we can see in the chapter that Elizabeth feels disgraced because she doesn't have a child. And in fact, in the culture of those days, in the Jewish thinking, they would have said, well, maybe God has cursed you because you don't have a child. Maybe he's made you barren for something that you have done. There was a bad stigma about this surrounding them. We can just imagine them praying for years about having a son. God, I want, I want, I want. And now they're old in age and they don't have a son, perhaps giving up hope. And so that would be the thing on their God, I want list. And I've already asked you to reflect on what's on your God, I want list. And so let's do that now. God, I want. God, I want to be a great parent. God, I want to be the best spouse that you've called me to be. God, I want to be an awesome student. God, I want to be a good child to my parents. God, I want to overcome depression. God, I want to overcome the sin that keeps on getting at me over and over again. God, I want. And we've seen on their want list, on Elizabeth and Zechariah's want list, a child, but I don't believe that that was the number one thing at this point in their life on their God, I want list. Let's explore. Verse 8. Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. A lot of information there. Let's boil it down a little bit. He was a priest. And in those days, there were 24 different divisions of priests. All of those divisions came from families that descended from the great high priest Aaron, the first high priest of Israel. So, every time that there was a festival, all the priests would come and they would serve in the tabernacle. But there were also times throughout the year, for one week, twice throughout the year, that the priests would come and take their turn, each division would take their turn to serve in the sanctuary. And so this was the Abijah division's turn to serve in the sanctuary. Now, they had a daily service in the sanctuary. It was called the Tamid service. And Tamid just means unfailing regularity because it happened every day. And so twice a day at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., a lamb would be brought out, slaughtered, and sacrificed. And people would come to the temple. This is what the temple looked like in Jesus' day. People would come to the temple to pray for forgiveness of sins. Now, it wasn't just the fact that the animal was being slaughtered, the lamb was being sacrificed. Also, priests would go inside of, let me see if I can get this, the holy place here, and they would take care of the menorah, and they would also put new incense on the altar of golden incense. And to choose which job you got as a priest, you chose by lots. So it was by chance. Now, there were over 18,000 priests at that time. So you only had a once-in-a-lifetime shot to, to be able to participate in this service. And so, here is Zacharias, once-in-a-lifetime shot to be the one that brings the incense into the holy place and to burn new incense. And he would have gone in there after the lamb would have been slaughtered, before it would have been offered as a burnt offering. And he would have been in there praying over Israel for forgiveness of the sins of the people that are there praying right now. But that's not the only thing that he would have been praying for. He would have been praying for the number one thing on his list and on Israel's want, God, I want list. And that was for national, uh, for them to get out of captivity as a nation. God had made some promises in Scripture that they would be taken out of captivity. They were still in captivity. Now, God made many promises, but there's one in specific that I believe Zechariah would have been praying for at this moment. He would have been praying for somebody called the Messiah to come and take his people out of captivity. You see, there was a prophecy that a lot of us are aware of, and he certainly was aware of. He was a man of Scripture, and that is found in the book of Daniel. And we find in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, that Daniel is praying for the same things that Zechariah was praying for here over the altar of burnt offering. So this is from Daniel chapter 9. This is verse 20. It says, and this is Daniel. 
Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God in behalf of the holy mountain of my God, same thing that Zechariah does here in Luke 1, while I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. This is Daniel praying just like Zechariah would have been praying, and the evening offering was the Tamid offering. So he's praying during the same time that Zechariah would pray 600 years later. And as he's praying for these things, what God does is he sends him Gabriel. Now he calls him a man here, but we know he's an angel. He sends him Gabriel to answer his prayers. And the answer that Gabriel gives him is a promise of the one called the Messiah, the one that's going to come save Israel. And not only that, but he tells him the time period in which the Messiah is going to come on the scene. This, of course, we know is the 490-year prophecy. So, fast forward now, and here is Zechariah. He knows that time prophecy, and he knows that it's about the time for the Messiah to come on the scene according to that prophecy. And here he is praying before the altar. He's asking for forgiveness of Israel's sins, and he is asking for the Messiah to come. God, fulfill your promise. And just like in Daniel, when Daniel was praying for these things, God sent Gabriel to answer him. God sent Gabriel to answer Zechariah. Verse 11, here in Luke chapter 1. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zechariah was troubled when he saw the angel and fear gripped him. Now later on in verse 19, it's revealed that this angel is Gabriel. And so something interesting about Gabriel, the only time that he appears in Scripture is here twice in Luke chapter 1 and in Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 9. And so when Luke names Gabriel, he wants us to connect this appearance of Gabriel with the last appearance of Gabriel in Daniel chapter 9. And so what's happened here in Daniel chapter 9, Gabriel was sent to make the promise of the Messiah... And then the next time that we see Gabriel here is in Luke 1, and he's come to tell of the promise of the Messiah fulfilled. And so how is God going to fulfill his promise here? It's very interesting how he starts off what Gabriel says here in verse 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. This is pretty awesome, isn't it? If we stopped right here, we'd be like, good for you, Zechariah, you're having a son. But that's not what Gabriel came to tell him. This is not the sum total that you're just having a son. This is about the Messiah coming. This is about answering the biggest want he's ever had. So he continues in verse 16, And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous, so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah was a man of Scripture. He would have understood what, he was being, what was being quoted here from Scripture as the one who was going to prepare people to meet Messiah. And so here we go, Zechariah. This is so awesome. We're reading this. Imagine if you're like Zechariah's best friend. Wouldn't you be pretty excited for him? Like, Zechariah, not only is the Messiah coming, not only are you going to have a son, but your son has something to do with the Messiah. This is so awesome. Aren't you so excited, Zechariah? Maybe I'm the only one excited about this. I don't know. Maybe I'm too excited. I don't know. But Zechariah is not excited. Oh, Zechariah. Verse 18. This is how he responds. Zechariah said to the angel, How will I know this for certain? For I am... I'm going to use that North Carolina accent. I'm going to try to anyways. For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. All right. <laughs> I tried. And we read this, and we're like, Zechariah, why? What are you doing? 
Zechariah, don't you remember? Your name means God remembers. Your wife's name means God is an oath. You were just praying in the holy place, in front of the altar of incense. An angel comes from God to reveal to you this awesome promise. And what are you doing? Why? You're doubting. Zechariah, come on, man. So why did he doubt? Why did Zechariah doubt God? Well, God answered his prayer in a way he never thought could be possible. Because he was looking at himself as the fulfillment of that promise. He stopped looking at the one who could, and he started looking at the one who can't himself. And it's a dangerous thing to keep your eyes on yourself, is it not? There's a couple of things that can happen when we do this. One, we can become full of ourselves. Man, I've done all these great things. I don't need God to help me. I'm just the one doing this in my life. Everything is cool. I don't need God. Maybe I'll come to church. Maybe I'll pray, whatever. For most of us, though, I don't think that's the case. What happens when we begin, the other thing that happens when we begin to look at ourselves is we begin to notice something. that We have limits. That we have failures. That we can't. And so when it comes to the things that we have on our God I want list, it turns into God I can't list. God, God, I want to be a good parent, but God, I can't. I keep on failing, God. God, I come home and I don't have enough energy for my kids. God, I can't say no to my boss for overtime. I've got to spend some more time at work with my kids. God, I can't. I fail. God, I want to be a good spouse. But I can't open my heart up to my spouse. I can't get over the things of my past. God, I can't. God. God, I want to get out of debt. But God, I can't. It's Christmas time, God. I can't. I've got to buy everybody Christmas presents. I've got to use my credit cards. I've got to go into debt. God, I can't get out of debt. God, I want to overcome this sin, but I can't keep on giving in. I keep on failing. God, I can't. God, I can't. God, I can't. And when we start looking at ourselves, we start becoming the I can't instead of, yes, you can, God. And we are so quick to speak when we're like that instead of listening to what God is telling us to do and believing. Just like Zechariah. And so how does God respond to Zechariah being so quick to speak here? In verse 19. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their proper time. So how does God respond to Zechariah here? With grace and mercy. He is standing in the presence of somebody who stands in the presence of God. He is in the holy place. He's in the temple where worship is. He is there on behalf of Israel. He is actually praying for something that God is saying yes to. And he's doubting and he's denying God. And what he deserves is the silence of the grave, but instead God is merciful and gives him the silence of his mouth. And so he finishes up his temple service. He goes home. He knows the promise of God. He tells his wife, maybe writes it down, I'm sure. She's like, I never heard that before. And the change in her body as she's pregnant is an affront to him. It's a sign to him about the faithfulness in the I can of God. So every time she wakes up with morning sickness and ugh, that shows him what God can do. And every time she has a craving, she wants pickles and ice cream. Or she wants bitter herbs and olive bread or whatever they had back then. That's a sign to him that God can. 
And every time the baby bump grows bigger and bigger and bigger, and he feels that little baby kicking in her womb, that is a sign to him that, no, I can't, but God, you can. And it took him nine long months of seeing that for him to realize it's not about him and what he can't do, but about what God can do in his life. And so John the Baptist, he's born, and he's circumcised. And finally, finally, God deems Zechariah ready to be able to speak. And this is what it says in Luke 164. He began to speak praise of God. The words out of his mouth were no longer, I can't, but God, I'm praising you because you can. In fact, let's go to those words in verse 68. Verse 68 here in chapter 1. Now, I want us to notice where his focus is. Now, he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he's prophesying. And it says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. And he has raised up a horn for the salvation for us. In the house of David, his servant, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. Do I have to make the point any more clear what was happening here? It was no longer about I can't. His focus was on the one that I can, the great I am. And so when we're looking at our God I want list, you're not the one that's, we are not the ones that are answering the want list. God is the one. God I want, but I can't. No, uh, uh, uh. God I want, but God you can. And you go to God, and you have the faith, and you're guided by God because he is the one that can do it. Now, that's not the only thing that we can learn from this, this story. You see what's happening here is that Zechariah is recounting something amazing. God has had a plan that the Messiah was going to come and save Israel this whole time. Now, before, Zechariah for some reason thought that it was his plan and his way and that God was a part of it. But now he is admitting that it's God's plan and Zechariah is a part of it. So when we're looking at our I want list, just a second, it's not about what we want, is it? It's about what God wants because it's his plan and we are a part of it. So we changed not I want, but we changed it to God. What do you want? Right? Now, does God want bad things for us? No, this is beautiful. God, I know you want me to be a good parent. God, I know you want me to be a good spouse. God, I know you want me to be a good student. The other thing that he's doing here, though, is he's remembering, he's remembering past things in which God was faithful. And if we're having issues with the God I can't, and we're not sure if God can, just take a gander back in your past and try to remember when God has been faithful to you and you can find the faith to push on because you know he's going to continue to be faithful. Can I tell you a personal story? Well, if you don't want me to, too bad, I'm going to anyways. <laughs> this is the theological seminary at Andrews University where I spent three long years of my life. Three beautiful years of my life. I praise the Lord for those years. And I was in my second of three years, and every Tuesday there was a chapel at 11 o'clock. And so I sat there in the seminary chapel, a room, it's about this size, probably, maybe a little bit bigger. And they always had announcements at the beginning of chapel, and I never listened to them because I didn't really care. But today was a little bit different. You see, it was February, and in March, all the conferences were coming up to interview potential seminarians to be hired. Meaning that if I got hired, I would have a stipend, I would have insurance, and I would have a lot of stress off my back because I would actually have a job while I was graduating. Now, a little bit of context here. I was very broke, very broke. I worked as much as I could, but I didn't make that much money. I was blessed, though. For one thing, I had met Callie already. We were already engaged at this point, so. Um, okay, where was I? <laughs> Very blessed. 
And so there I was, I was sitting there, oh, I had a student loan that was due from my undergrad, and there was absolutely zero way I could pay that student, none. No, I couldn't even pay half that student loan. I was broke. Man, it was bad. And so I had been praying weeks leading up to that, knowing that the conferences were coming, thinking, man, this is my way. I'm going to do this. God, you've got to get me hired. God, I want to be, I want to interview God. I want to interview God. And I sat there that day in the chapel, and the announcement was all about how you sign up for interviews. Now, in the past, when you went to the seminary, no matter what year you were there, you could always interview with a conference. So that day, when one of my professors got up and she said, you know, uh, I think we're going to make some changes to the uh, interview process here. And I was like, what? She said, unless you are graduating this May, this August, or this December, you cannot interview with the conferences. Now, I wish that I would have been right there being like, all right, the Lord's going to provide anyways, you know, and get up and walk out and praise the Lord, but that's not what happened. I started grumbling. I started complaining. In fact, vocally, I probably made a fool of myself sitting there with my other seminarians. And when I got home and I got some quiet time to God, I was like, God, why did you do this? I can't interview. What's going on? How is this going to work? What's going to happen? I also was about to run out of money to stay in seminary. I forgot to mention that point. That's kind of a minor point. So and I wasn't about to go into more debt, student loan debt, in order to stay in seminary. So I said, God, what's going to happen? You just sent me here to get into debt and then not even to finish graduating? Now, also during the announcement time, they had said that the conferences that were coming up would need some personal assistance that would help, you know, get them some lunch, get them some water, usher people in and out of interviews. And so as I was lamenting to God and grumbling and complaining to God, he's like, why don't you just sign up to be an assistant? And I fought with God. I said, that's not going to work. That's not the plan. I'm supposed to interview. Grumbling, though, I did it anyways. In fact, I was the first person in line that day when it came, when the conferences were there. And my heart actually was set on the Kentucky-Tennessee conference. I wanted to work there. I love Tennessee because I went to school there. It's a beautiful part of the country. And as I went to sign up for Kentucky-Tennessee, it was like the Holy Spirit smacked my hand, and something about Texas jumped off the page to me. <laughs> Texas? Who wants to live in Texas? <laughs> so I signed up for the Texas conference. And I met the guys. There are three of them, very nice people. We sat down in the room that, we, that they were going to interview all the seminarians. They started asking me a few questions, questions like, so how's your seminary experience been? What church have you worked in? What is your passion in ministry? What's your testimony? Do you have a resume? And of course, I was wearing a suit, and I put the resume right here, so I pulled it right out. <laughs> the Holy Spirit prepared me. See, what happened that day was God did something that I couldn't do. He got me an interview before anybody else was interviewed. Before these guys were tired of hearing all the, question, uh, all the answers to the questions they were asking, God gave me an interview. And by the time I left that day, one of the guys was giving me a big bear hug. He's like, I can't wait to see you again sometime. Now, if you're in seminary and you're not hired, chances that you're going to get hired before you graduate seminary are like this much. I'm not sure what statistic that is, but this is a statistic. It's about that much. So a week later, they gave me a call. And they said, Bill, the Holy Spirit has brought you to our minds, and we want to hire you with one year left in seminary. And I praise the Lord. I grumbled the whole time. I complained, God, I can't, but God can now, just a little side note, I was so excited, I called everybody I knew. I told every, hey, I'm moving to Texas, yeah! And after I told everybody, I called my fiance. And I said, Callie, guess what? We're moving to Texas, babe! And I won't tell you about her response. That'll be another sermon on forgiveness. So, so 
So what's on your God I want list? Let's do this as we end the sermon today. You know, we can take this list home, copy it down, do what you have to do. What is that thing on your God I want list? And change it to this. Instead of God I want, say, God, is this what you want? Is this what you want? It's your plan, not my plan. And then we know we can say, not I want, but God, you want. And what can stop God with something that he wants? God, you want me to be a good parent. I can't, but God, you can. God, you can help me to love my kids. You can help me to disciple my kids. The power is yours. Live through me. God, God, listen, God, you want me to get out of debt. God, I can't, but God, you can. You can help me set a budget. I don't know how to set a budget, God, but you can help me set a budget. God, you can help me to be faithful with tithe and offerings. God, you can. God, God, I want to overcome this sin. God, I can't, but God, you can. God, live in me, God. Your power, your strength, you can, God. Go home today and reflect on your God, I want list in this season of wish lists and want lists and family and friends and all those good things. And today, as we close, I just want to say thank you to the Lord for being faithful. As I share my story, my wife and I love being here. It is a blessing. Who wants to live in Texas? I want to live in Texas. In Colleen, Texas, that is. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Jesus, we just want to thank you for your faithfulness that you give to us. Lord, our lives are so dependent on you. Some of us don't even realize it, but Lord, every breath is dependent on your faithfulness to us. Lord, as we leave this place, help us to remember that you love us so much that we're here, that we're breathing, that we have life. It's a blessing. You are a blessing just to know you. Father, I just want to pray for the Holy Spirit to be poured out on everybody in this room today. Open all of our hearts up to you. And help us to be more considerate now, not of what we want, but what you want for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Now we're moving on in our service. This would be appropriate if you have, you know, a roast in the oven uh, or something at home you need to get to, go ahead. We're going to have our special prayer time now. And if there's anybody that has a prayer request or a praise, please raise your hand and we'll make sure that you get a microphone. Okay. Okay, let's see. Is anybody that's got a praise to God this morning? Okay, we got to praise Brother Denver. Of course, I, I have my two children here, and they're in Texas with me, so I am very happy. Okay, children, tell us your <laughs> names, please. My name is Kanda, and I'm a physical therapist in Loma Linda. 